Centralization also makes immigration more easy because now they can ride in a steamship and this is faster, more reliable, they don't have to worry about falling in the doldrums with the sailboat. Since it's faster, it also saves uh, time and money for the uh, food on board since they don't spend as long on board. They, they don't spend as long away from work. They don't have to spend as much on food. <clears throat> and, so, and so that's why it only costs $20 to go from Italy to the Americas. Uh, and the shipping lines even specialize in these uh, emigrant ships. The first and second class passengers didn't have to stop at Ellis Island. And they weren't considered emigrants by Italy or by the United States. If you could afford first or second class, then they figure you're not a worker. You're not emigrating for work. But second class costs three times as much as the third class ticket. So most people travel third class. And they'd set up entire ships only third class without even any first or second class. <clears throat> and so uh, all the third class passengers had to go through the inspections in Alice Island for health and morality and, and all the different uh, hurdles that the Congress had passed for immigrants to, to jump through. But also, they passed through the inspection before they left as well. If they failed the inspection, the shipping company had to pay to send them back. So, so they actually went through the inspection at the port of departure because the shipping company wanted to make sure everyone would get through. So actually, it was less than 1% were rejected at Ellis Island. <clears throat> and just a comment. Oh, I, sure, I, sure. Actually, about 10, 12, I can't remember how many years, at least 10 years ago, I actually worked on the Ellis Island records and was a specialist in doing, this is a record extraction for the Ellis Island Foundation. And, a, a, an expert in doing the Italian records and in teaching everybody else how to do it. And in fact, you're right, the, the, the ship's records were, um, as the people came on, they gave their names and they wrote it down. And, and you're right, there's about 26 different questions that had to be filled in, including, including the health and the sanity and where you were going and if there was somebody going to take you. But as they came into the states then, there was a second check and some of the, those Ellis Island ships registers then had corrections on them. Interestingly enough, um, Italians tend to, when they get their name, they get their last name first and then their first name. And so that's a point of confusion when some people were doing the extraction because they weren't sure. And that's, that's where my expertise came in in knowing what was first and last name. But, but it is very interesting. And as you showed the graph just a couple of things before, um, in fact, 1912, I think, was the year that the largest number of Italian immigrants came through Ellis Island, and most of them came from the south, um, most of them from Naples or from Sicily, in fact. Was, uh, and they were, like you said earlier, the largest immigrant group to come through, but in that period of time especially. So, Anyways, yes. I, have, I have a lot of expertise on this, I yes, haven't and, worked with the records. And, uh, Right, don't, don't hold your comments and questions to the end. Yeah. These, these are just amazing numbers. So 550,000 coming to the United States uh, and uh, South America in one year, yeah. almost 900,000 in a single year yeah. leaving Italy. Just amazing yeah. numbers. So by the 1911 census, one sixth of Italy's population was overseas. And so most of it was from the south, <laughs> right? And um, especially the Southerners went to uh, the United States, and and um, the Northerners went more to Central Europe, yeah. Western Europe, and and South America. Although also many came to the United States as well. Um, and. The reason it affected Italy so much was about half returned yeah. home to Italy. So out of the millions, and that still, still leaves many millions abroad, mm -hmm. but also many millions coming 
back to to Italy. Uh, Twenty six million left Italy from Italy, from 1876 to 1976, and thirteen million from 1876 to 1915. So thirteen million going abroad, and then uh, six or seven million coming back. That's return migration after having gone through this this nationalizing experience. So, so the, the political division before Italian unification also was shown in the different languages in Italy, in the different parts of Italy. Italy as the peninsula is divided by mountains and, and, uh, and valleys, each different part developed its own uh, language or dialect. <clears throat> but when they're abroad, they're treated as Italians, and then when they come home, they're actually hailed as Americans. <laughs> Even though, of course, they, they still have Italian citizenship. Uh, they, they've traveled around the world, they, they have a much broader perspective, and they bring back very valuable skills to Italy itself. In the tradition of some of the greatest leaders in the country, Mazzini had been an exile in Switzerland and then England, and then Garibaldi had also been an exile in Brazil and Uruguay, and and then after he fought in 1848 in, in 1849 in Italy, he also was in exile in the United States. The Italian Americans built this pantheon over his house <laughs> that he stayed in in uh, Staten Island. So they really feel this valid connection to Italy itself, that they're not permanently away from the mother country, but, but they're uh, economic exiles, if not political exiles, and it's likely that they'll return home, and many have that as their dream. Beautiful Italy, the, the beautiful country, uh, just seems to many a more uh, wonderful place than what they call the United States, the land of the dollar, the land of dollars, the land of capitalism, working for, for uh, working so hard for, for money. The, a lot of the Italians don't see this as real life in the United States. And, and also in the book I, I talk about uh, Jane Addams in uh, Chicago, working with Italian immigrants, and and it's clear that she thought the Italian immigrants were basically ignorant, and the Italian immigrants thought the Americans were ignorant, <laughs> because the Italians are coming here to work so hard, and then the Italians also see the Americans as working basically too hard, and not appreciating art and culture and these finer things, and so. It's really sad that both sides are basically the same, and they're and they're accusing each other of the same false accusations of being too capitalist, working <laughs> too hard. So the Italian state really wanted to encourage people to learn Italian while they're abroad, to uh, be able to speak with one another across these different. Uh, divides uh, language and dialect. And the Italians abroad united around the figure of Garibaldi and also around the figure of uh, Christopher Columbus, who identified the New World in the first place. So even though Garibaldi was an anti-Catholic figure, having fought against the church states in Rome, uh, Columbus was, was neither uh, religious nor irreligious, so, so that was one unifying figure for everyone to follow. And the Italian state also set up schools for Italian children abroad. And um, I think this picture from <laughs> Libya kind of captures um, the idea of putting together the structure on uh, basically on an idea, not on a solid uh, institutional foundation, but, but basically 
on just a strength of will. That the Italians abroad will 